chapter 22-2 and Gauss's law. I'll try to explain you the reasoning behind Gauss's law by picking up from where we left in the previous video. So here we have this surface shown in green that is penetrated by all these field lines. And every field line that is going in is also coming out at some other point. For example here it's going in and it produces negative flux and a little bit later when it comes out it produces the same amount of positive flux and that applies to all these field lines that are piercing the surface. So the total flux in this case must be zero. What goes in as negative comes out as positive. So the total integral of the flux is zero. The reason for this zero net flux is the following. Only electrical charge can source or sink electric field lines or electric fields. So for example, if we have a positive charge here, we know that it produces field lines. There we go. It produces field lines emanating from it. So now we have these field lines that are going out, but they're never coming in. So they will produce some non-zero flux. Another option is if we have negative charge then the flux lines or electric field lines are coming in but they're never going out so they also produce non-zero flux. So Hence, the only case when we have we can have non-zero flux is when we have some electrical charge Q enclosed within our surface. And to complete the exact Gauss's law we divide the enclosed charge by epsilon zero, which is another electrical constant. In this, in fact, this is called the permittivity of free space, and it has the value 8.85 times 10 to the minus two coulomb squared divided by newton and meter squared. The Gauss's law says that if we know something about the electric field on the surface we can say something about the charge that is inside the surface or the other way around if you know how much charge is inside our surface we can tell something about the electric field at the surface and this is the usual case when we are applying Gauss's law. It's obvious that solving electrical field from an equation like this, where the A is, e is embedded in the integral, is not easy. So in fact, the using of Gauss's law for finding electric fields is limited to cases where the symmetry of the situation allows us to conclude that the E is constant on that surface and then it pops out from the integral. So let's have an example. So we have an electric charge here and we are interested in what is the electrical field produced by this charge. We know already that it's emanating in all directions so it's spherically symmetric. So let's 
pick our surface to be sphere around it. Now, if we apply this equation, we know that the electric field everywhere on this surface is constant. It has the value E, whatever it is. So our integral E times dA Q enclosed E0 this is constant so it pops out And uh, what is the surface integral over all these surface elements? It's just the total surface area of the sphere, which is 4 pi r squared, like we already calculated in the previous video. And now we have q, en q enclosed e0. From here, we can solve for the electric field anywhere on the surface. And that is q enclosed divided by 4 pi e0 r squared. And in fact, we have the relationship that e0 is 1 over 4 pi k. Oh, the other way around. k is 1 over 4 pi e0. So if we plug this in, we get k times q enclosed. Second part, by the way, r squared which is a familiar result from chapter 21 for the electric field of a point charge. I'll briefly reiterate the key steps in this example calculation. So we had a electric charge that we knew already of having radial electric field lines emanating from it. And because of that, it makes perfect sense to have our surface to be spherical, to allow for the symmetry to kick in. In this case, the E is constant on the spherical surface because all those points are exactly equally far away from the charge itself. That makes the E constant on this surface and, and that makes evaluating this otherwise difficult integral possible. The situation could look more more complicated. For example, we could have charges outside our surface producing their own electric fields, field lines, which might cut through our surface. But we don't have to care about them. The Gauss's law states explicitly that we are only concerned of the charge that is enclosed within the surface. So we don't have to worry about this. We do have to worry about all the electric field lines that they are producing because that's what the integral says everything has to be included but we know already from this illustration that if a field line comes in and goes out it produces zero net flux and that is also the case with these disturbing field lines here 
in essence, they don't change the result of our calculation. The fact that we only have to be concerned of what lies within this surface is, is the reason why Gauss's law is such an elegant tool for evaluating electrical field at some, some surface around our charge distribution. As usual, we had a couple of exercises in the book that needed to be answered. So first one, exercise B. A point charge Q is at the center of a spherical Gaussian surface, A. The second charge is placed outside. The total flux through the spherical surface A is unchanged, doubled, halved, none of these. So first when we have the only the charge within, our field lines will penetrate through the surface like this. And now if we add the second charge, it will produce some field lines going through. But as we saw already, these don't produce any net, net flux because they come in as negative and leave out as positive, so their contribution is zero. So the total flux through this spherical surface remains unchanged. In exercise C, we have three charges within a box, and we're supposed to calculate the total flux that they're producing. We will use Gauss's law to answer this question. So the total flux is the surface integral of E times dA. And from Gauss's law, we know that this is equal to the Q enclosed divided by E0. So what is the Q enclosed? We have three of these charges. Each one of them is 2.95 times 10 to the minus 6 coulombs and divided by E0, which is 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12 coulomb squared divided by Newton meter squared. And this is 10 to the 6 Newton meters squared per coulomb, which is option D. In exercise F, we are supposed to answer some questions about Gauss's law. First of all, if we know the charge enclosed by a surface, we always know the electric field everywhere at the surface. Let's think about this. So if we know the charge enclosed, we can tell what the E is at any given point in space. This is not true. So as you can see, we can only tell what is the total flux out of it. But what is the actual electric field that produces the flux? We cannot say it in general case. Only when the E is constant on our surface, we can state what is the value of E. But in general case, we cannot. So A is false. B, when I'm finding the electric field with Gauss's law, we always use a sphere for the Gaussian surface. Well, this is not true. So a sphere is great for single charges like this. For example, if we have a conductor that has a lot of, let's say, positive charges along, and this is infinitely long, 
this is not a spherically symmetric case. In this case, we would want to use a cylinder for our surface. So it all depends on the geometry of the situation, what kind of surface is a good choice. So B is also false. C, if we know the total flux through a surface, we also know the total charge inside the surface. So if we know the total flux, we know the total charge. This is true. And D, we can only use Gauss's law if the electric field is constant in space. It doesn't have to be constant, so it can be, for example, varying as a function of time. It doesn't really matter. In that sense, Gauss's law is the universal law for calculating the electric field produced by some charge distribution. Mm -hmm.